Hey there, your friends. Dave Polinus, Can-Am Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. And uh, I appreciate you being here. We just got the first snow of the season in the mountaintops around us here in Mon northern Montana. It's a bit chilly outside, but it's not that bad. The issue for me right now is uh, I've got some major projects going on, and I just don't have the time to drive an hour and film for an hour and come back and kill half my day doing that. I wish I did. Just easier for me to drive out to the uh, silo here and get her done. But uh, a couple things I want to talk to you about because I've had several emails saying, Dave, where's your next movie? Where is it? How come it's not done? Where are you? First of all, <laughs> I never committed to doing another movie. And I'm not saying that I'm doing one, I'm not saying I'm not doing one, but as anyone can probably tell by now, I'm pretty fastidious in how I do my projects. And if they're not going to be A1 in my mind, I'm not doing them. And uh, if they're not appealing, if they aren't unusual and they fit this criteria I'm looking for, it's just not going to happen. Now, doing a movie I've learned so much from when Ben and I first started till now that it's, uh, it's scary. One of the things I learned about doing a movie is you need people around you that are the best in the world. And what I mean by that is that if you hire second-rate people that have problems in their life, they're going to bring those problems right onto your film. And it's quite a uh, it's quite a show once it gets going because we spend a lot of time together we spend you know anywhere between three and six months together filming and you get to be a pretty tight-knit family and you really don't know who you're working with until you get out there in the field and you understand all their idiosyncrasies and their issues and again I'm a pretty easygoing guy but for some reason the film industry has a lot of problem people a lot and it seems that a lot of people migrate to that that have a high skill set but many of them have difficulty working with others and uh, maybe they got into filming thinking that they could just stay behind the camera and not associate or not socialize that's not not the truth if you want to be successful you have to be able to get along and uh yeah interesting conundrum so let me just explain to you the way the documentaries have gone together in the past because this will help you understand how complex this is. So I have this idea in my head, right? I want to do a story, let's say, about uh, small kids that disappeared in the wilderness. So I get a series of stories together and then you have to get approval to film in certain locations. That takes about a month. You have to get insurance, liability insurance. That's very expensive. Then you got to make travel plans for anywhere from three to eight people that are on your crew. Then you have to set up lodging. And if it's in an area that's popular, that can be very expensive. Then transportation. You see what I'm saying? It's complicated. And then you usually have a set period of time to be at that location and then you're on to the next location. So there's really not a lot of variance in the time you can spend in places because you're on this schedule based on transportation costs, lodging, bookings. It's complicated. And also witness availability. The truth is, and this is this is my little secret to you, that witnesses are the bread and butter to any good documentary. It's not the location, the story is important, but it's really the witnesses and the people you get on screen that make or break a documentary. And getting those people at a comfort area to talk about their incident on screen is critical. And I've learned along the way that First, getting them on screen is one issue. Getting them comfortable talking about it 
on screen is an issue. And uh, it's always better to get somebody on screen at the scene. That's even harder to do sometimes because the incidents happen so far away from what had happened. Now, when we did Missing 411 The Hunted, and we were on scene in the Sierras, uh, an all day horseback ride into the middle of the wilderness to film these scenes, it was uh, one of the biggest efforts to do anything I've ever done in my life. That was huge. That uh, was when we were doing at the Ron Moorhead campground. And logistically, cost-wise, this is just super expensive. And uh, people around me have said, Dave, your movies have taken you to an audience that your books have never or would never have reached. So even though it's really expensive, the audience that you reached and the message that you were able to forward to them has been well worth it. And they keep telling me that. And I guess that's my justification in the last two movies for doing them. Now the question comes to mind, is there really more of a viable audience to reach that I haven't reached so far? Or is the next movie get just going to be viewed as entertainment? And if that is, I don't want to do it. So we looked at the numbers on what the last two movies have uh, generated in views, minutes viewed, and there's millions and millions of minutes viewed on YouTube, on Amazon, Hulu, it's huge. The distributors have said that these are two of the biggest documentaries that they've seen in years based on the minutes viewed. So, and putting them out there for you to watch for free is part of that effort to get people even that were maybe moderately interested but didn't want to pay to push them over that brink and say, okay, it's costing you nothing. Just watch it. See what you think. That's worked. And the ratings <clears throat> that those two movies have had are extraordinary. <laughs> I'm, I've been very lucky. I appreciate everything you guys have done. And I'm glad that you appreciate what we've done. But if you look at the reviews for Missing 411 and Missing 411 The Hunted on Amazon, they're stellar. Now, the books. It's a whole nother thing. There's a categorical leap in difference between somebody who is unwilling to read a book and somebody who just wants to watch videos and movies. And then you have the book readers over here, which are quite different. And I understand that now, and I probably didn't when Ben first came to me and said, Dad, let's, uh, let's do some videos about missing people. And, I, uh, and then we did those first ones in Colorado, and then we did more in Australia. So I understand the difference. But I also understand, and you got to understand, you got to get a feeling for the flow. When I'm doing my research and I'm going through archives and I'm, I'm following up on cases, it helps me to get the story flow if I put it on paper. And you will always find, always find more details in books than you'll ever see in a movie. And that's why the people who read books and then go watch a movie will always say, you know, they'll say, eh, the movie was better than the book. Probably not. The book was better than the movie just because there's tons more details. Typical movie that distributors look at, they want a movie to be about an hour and a half long, give or take 10 minutes. Each of our movies has been an hour and 37 minutes long, and that's been perfect in their opinion. Personally, the next movie I make, I wish it was two hours long because it gives us more time to get into more detail. But we get more pushback from the distributors because that's a wider gap when they sell it overseas or to a distributor, uh, say on Hulu or something, that's a lot of time for them on their channel to bulk up for a movie. And uh, they view it as risk. So 
I doubt I'll ever win that battle, but I'll keep pushing. But the general flow of a movie, you go out in the field and you film it. Well, first you're at home and you lay out the storyline. You set up all of the film dates, go out and film, come back, and me and a director will sit down with the editors and give our opinion about how this flows out on screen. And that sometimes is quite different than what you had at the beginning at the house when you were first laying out the storyline. Because in a documentary, it ebbs and flows. You get things that you never thought you'd find before. And then all of a sudden, wow, we got this, we got to put it in. So then the editor starts to lay it out. And when it is laid out, then it goes to music. Then it goes to a sound expert that levels the sound through the whole documentary. This is interesting because when you're watching it after it's been edited, but not gone to sound, you can see the highs and lows because certain areas you're not wearing a mic, other areas you have to wear a mic, and the sound levels are very different. And then the last thing it goes to is colorization. Colorization is, again, it just levels the color all the way across so you don't come out with these real vibrant things. You know, sometimes you're sitting at home and all of a sudden the screen blares because there's an add-on that's over-modulating just to catch your attention. That's annoying as heck. You'll never find that in a good documentary or a movie. They've got that covered. Now one of the things right before it goes to editing, when you come back and you're sitting down and you're starting to lay out the movie, it has to go to special effects. Special effects can mean a lot of things. In, in The Hunted, we had that white tubular thing that came through the campground, almost like some kind of aerial phenomenon. That's special effects, and it's super expensive. <laughs> oh, the first time they sat me down and talked to me, I'm thinking, oh my God, where am I gonna get this money? But it really makes or breaks the film. And uh, I guess I'm glad I did it. But I think about how much money I spent on my kids' college education, I'm thinking, that's a percentage of it right there. So, whatever. Movies are very complicated. Learned a lot. Uh, I suppose I'd like to do another one, but there's such a big effort. And there's so many things I don't have control over that is the issue. Now, let me talk about a book. Writing a book is not as complicated as everyone thinks once you've got it all down in your mind. If you're a good, organized person, you can probably write a book. And first, the basic thing, write a summary and an outline of what you want to say, where you want to start, what's the body of the book going to be about, and what's the ending of the book going to be about. And just lay it out. And then set aside a lot of writing and a lot of time and put your nose to that computer and start typing away. For me, if I have six weeks, seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a day, I can get a book done. But for me, if I'm in the middle of writing, and I get interrupted, it really messes me up. Because I'm in a certain flow, and then I stop, and to get back into that flow again, I know it sounds ridiculous, it sounds petty, but it's really a big deal. If you know anybody that writes, it is a big deal. So after you write a book, and you gotta decide, you wanna put in drawings, you wanna put in pictures, do you have releases for the pictures? Did you take the pictures? Then you need to send it out to somebody, because I, I don't have the skill, to lay the book out so that the print goes around the photos, so it fits within the criteria of the size of the book you're writing, etc. Now, the last thing, the index. Oh, it's my pet peeve, and truthfully, this is. In a nonfiction book, if you don't have an index, and I pick the book up, I'm just gonna put it back on the counter. 
because it tells me a lot about the author. It tells me they're lazy. Once a book of say 120,000 words is completed, it'll take an author about three days to do an index. Now, once the book's laid out, meaning it's set for the size of the book that you're gonna distribute it, and it's wrapped around photos and things, and you've got page numbers on it, now you can write the index, complete the index, because you have the page numbers on where this is happening. And then you gotta send it back to the layout person, they gotta include the index, then you get the book back, then you gotta find somebody to print it. Printing is a whole nother different deal. There are several really good big print houses in the US. I'm pretty lucky I found one. And based on the number of books you order is the price of the book. Now these big book houses with these huge authors that, that sell a million copies and print a million copies, those people are paying a couple dollars for a regular size book, if that maybe. And then if you're ordering 100 books at a time, you're paying a lot, <laughs> you're paying a lot. And paper costs have gone up a lot in the last 18 months. Just the last 18 months. I can't believe it. Uh, you haven't seen a price increase from me in 11 years on my books. So I'm hoping I can hold that line, but it is getting tough. Yeah. And then distributing the books, most authors put them on Amazon. I kind of took a hard-nosed approach from the beginning. At the very beginning, I was with a company called CreateSpace that helped me format the books, do all those things I was telling you about. They were owned by Amazon, but they were an independent company. And they had an agreement that for all the authors that they were working with, you had to put your book on Amazon. Well, I put my books on Amazon for six hours and then I pulled them off. So there was always a place there and that's how they got a massive amount of views for Missing 411 East and Missing 411 West, and then I left. And then other people put the books on Amazon that were selling them. But just because Missing 411 East and West have tons of reviews, I guess people think, oh, then they must be the best books. Yeah, that's not, not the response I get from, from readers. The only reason those books have tons more reviews is because they were put on Amazon way before, and I'm not doing it now. So uh, an example like Missing 411 Montana, I checked the other day, I didn't even see it on Amazon. Some people think, oh, it's a junk book. No, <laughs> it's got it's a lot of those books. And Missing 411 Law in Canada, I don't think Canada's on Amazon either, it might be, but yeah, don't, don't fret. Just because the book is not on Amazon doesn't mean it's not reviewed highly. I've been very lucky. Now, lastly, I promised a group of people I'd talk about this. My Bigfoot books. A lot of people have tried to tear me apart because I wrote about Bigfoot. Oh, he's, he's insane. He's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's lost his mind. He's a conspiracy theorist. No. I took a very pragmatic, logical approach when I wrote Missing F or when I wrote The Hoopa Project, the first book I ever wrote. And that was picked up by Hancock House Publishing. And they did that one and Tribal Bigfoot. The, uh, the reviews on The Hoopa Project on Amazon are almost perfect. And same with Tribal Bigfoot. And then the, the third book I did about Bigfoot, Bigfoot, Wild Men and Giants, is a book that all it has in it is newspaper articles from the 1700s that describe a bipedal creature just like the Bigfoot we know of today. And I've included them all the way up until like 1927, I think. So, yeah, no, I'm not afraid to talk about the Bigfoot issue. I, I, am, I am a target for people who want to tear me down and think, oh, you know, he must be stupid. He's talking about this. You know, there's a lot of people who have a lot of different interests in life. And I don't consider anybody an idiot if they research a topic because they're interested. And if they report on it factually, 
I have no problem what you want to talk about. But people do have that problem when you talk about something on a factual nature. They want to claim they know something about it and they want to tear you down and in reality they probably haven't spent an hour truthfully looking into the background of it. So, the Hooper Project, Tribal Bigfoot, and Bigfoot Wildman and Giants are the three books about Bigfoot that I've written. And uh, we also have a, uh, a Bigfoot map of Northern California that we did when uh, I was in the heart of the Bigfoot topic and I was plotting locations, just like I plot missing people now, I was plotting Bigfoot sightings then. And that, that map is a big seller. So, enough about that. Uh, today, I've got some really, really good letters. This article came in from CBS8.com. Title was Children's Mental Health Declared a National Emergency. Okay. A lot of people don't want to believe me. That's fine. I don't care. I've told you before that when this pandemic is over and all of the sicknesses and all the hospitalizations start to come down, if the mainstream media wants to tell the truth, the bottom line story is going to be mental health and what it did to us. So, CBS 8 out of San Diego. Pediatricians across the country are sounding the alarm about children's mental health. In San Diego, Rady, Rady Children's Hospital is reporting a 25% increase in ER visits during the pandemic with kids suffering from depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. The American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association have declared it a national emergency. Now, some of you, I've received hundreds of emails and notes on these videos. Would you please stop talking about mental health? You're, you know, this is, what, you, you want a mental health channel? What is this, the crazy channel? Hey, fool, if you have been so fortunate that you haven't had a mental health crisis yet, I'm very thankful for you. But you know what? There aren't a lot of people I know of that haven't been challenged and their mental health hasn't been pushed to the extreme by what's going on in our world right now. So if we're gonna to stay together as this village, we need to talk about some of the things in society that we're faced with. And I'm going to continue to talk about mental health. And if somebody out there doesn't like it, it's not going to do you any good at all to write to me and complain. Because you know what? 99% of the people on this channel think I should talk about it. So turn the camera off, go grab your coffee, go jump in your car, take off. Even before the pandemic, children's mental health has been increasing at a very fast rate. Adding in the layer to, of the pandemic for the last two years, we've seen a dramatic increase in children's mental health, said Dr. Jenkins, the inpatient medical director for psychiatry at Rady Children's Hospital. When I started this work, we'd rarely see a child talking about suicide. Now it's a commonplace. We frequently have children as young as eight in our emergency room talking about suicide. Oh God. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention says, compared to 2019, in 2020, ER visits for mental health rose by 24% for children between the ages of 5 and 11 and 31% for those 12 to 17. Teenage girls are especially at risk with suspected suicide up 51% those 12 to 17. Now, some in the media are starting to talk about this. I talked to you about this over a year ago. It's happening right now. Be aware. If you got a child in these age groups, keep an open dialogue with them, stay close to them. 
if you think something's wrong, something might be wrong, get a little closer to them and have that talk. Among children under 18, mental health in California is now the leading cause of hospitalization. The Bipartisan State Oversight Group released a study about COVID's impact on kids' mental health, saying while the state is investing more than $4 billion to address the problem, there needs to be a better leadership and partnership among schools, providers, and health plans to ensure kids' needs are being met. Now, stop right here. Here's the issue. I don't care if you've got one of the best health plans in the world. Mental health is not prioritized on that, on that medical plan. And that's a shame because it's a big deal. And people may not have the resources, even with a medical plan, to get the mental health treatment they need. I think that's bad. I think these medical plans need to get allocate more of those resources, meaning dollars and cents, to helping these kids that need it. Most childhood mental illness is treatable and we have safe established treatments for mental health, said Dr. Jenkins. At Rady Children's Hospital, there's a pediatric psychiatry emergency room for every child who comes into the hospital, no matter the reason. In 2020, 3,000 kids admitted to Rady's ER tested positive for suicidal thoughts. My God. Dr. Jenkins says parents can also contact their child's pediatrician, school counselor, or dial 211 for county provided services in San Diego. First and foremost, though, she advises parents to talk to their kids. Don't be afraid to ask your child directly about suicide. Asking about, asking about suicide doesn't cause suicide. If anything, it saves lives, said Dr. Jenkins. I've said this a hundred times. People are reluctant to step across and really talk about this. Oh my God, if I bring up suicide, you know, maybe that'll cause them to do it. Friends, if somebody out there has been thinking about suicide, they've been thinking about it a thousand times more than you have. Come on, you gotta have these talks. But think about the uh, eight to 10 year old having suicidal thoughts, just, what has happened? You know, I get people who write to me about this and say, well, Dave, maybe it's fast food. Maybe it's we're interbreeding too much. I get all kinds of thought. Maybe uh, the other one I heard the other day, Dave, maybe it's 5G. Somebody else wrote me the other day, a good one, and said, you know the Wi-Fi in our house, Dave? Do we really know what's doing, what it's doing to us as people? And do you underdeveloped are people that are still developing? Children's, does this have an impact on them that we don't understand? I don't know. How about kids with a cell phone next to their head a lot? Is that doing something to their brain? I don't know. All things to think about. New letter. Dave, sorry for naming this urgent, but I need to get your attention. I've watched your videos religiously for the past three years and have spoken about you many times to others. Recently, your discussion about suicide has really received my attention, purely because it has affected so many of us in so many ways. For the past few months, I have heard countless incidents of suicide. The cause and reasons we'll never really know, nor should we ever judge. One thing that keeps popping into my mind is the painful truth that we have become so disconnected from ourselves, which has knocked our inner confidence and I would like you to please speak to this. The reason I'm asking you to champion this is because it feels that I have gotten to know you over the past few years. You have been faced with incredible challenges yet still remain dedicated to your causes. And I can only narrow this down to your absolute strength and your self-belief. You have, you have to please appreciate the gravity on how many people's lives you have changed and touched not only on your work for 411, but also for your pure strength you have shown us this year. You, you, sir, are someone many of us look up to, and please do not ever lose that energy. I thank you for your incredible strength, dedication, and sheer bravery. 
Well, thanks. I'm glad I have your support. Inner strength and confidence. You know, I've been in advanced schools where they talk about this. And you've got to believe in yourself, number one. Number two, the greatest leaders and the greatest business people have done one thing in their life. What's that? They failed. Just because you fail one time doesn't make you a failure. Do you get up, put your boots back on, straighten your tie, walk back out there and get back in the business place? Or do you hide in the corner and talk about that failure the rest of your life? Hmm, not me. I'm gonna pull my boots on, put my coat on and go right back out there. Just because I do a video that maybe gets only a 98.5% approval rating, I'm gonna go in the corner and hide. Forget it. That just means a lot of people like to give me a thumbs down. There's always going to be people in this world that have a problem with you or me or somebody else. And unfortunately, you may find them at the inopportune time. But you know what? There's 10 other people out there that really are going to like you. They like your style, your personality, maybe what you represent. And those are the people you want to align with. That other group, I hope they watch. And I know I'm not going to get nine out of 10 of them. Maybe I just get one. And maybe that one person comes over and actually spends the time to listen, to understand. And you know what they'll do? They'll go back to that other nine and tell them, hey, you may have got this all wrong. This is really the way it is. Maybe you should listen. And they'll be your best advocate. And that's the truth. So that inner self, that, that's your soul. And that'll never change. Now your day-to-day -day attitude about life will change. But really what you are as a person will never change. You gotta have that belief if you wanna be happy and successful and productive. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I don't think humans were put on this earth to sit and have things given to them. Sorry, don't believe it. If you think back to the day, as little as 2,000 years ago, we were hunters and gatherers. We lived outside and we hunted for food and we gathered food and that's how we survived. And there weren't many people that were overweight then because you had to work hard. You spend eight, spend eight hours every day doing just that, getting your water, building maybe a shelter. That's right. So today, where everyone is, everyone has the ability right now to be productive if they want to be. And I'm going to get a bunch of emails saying, oh, Dave, you don't know, I have this disability, I have that. If you had the ability to merely send me an email, then you have the ability to write. <laughs> and if you have the ability to write, there's a lot of things you can do with that. A lot. Look at it. Go around the internet. See what you can do. And the first time you sell an article to somebody, 
You're going to go, wow. Hey, that was a project I completed. I got paid for it. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. That's right. Baby steps. Or maybe you go down to WordPress and you start your own blog. Blog about something you know. I don't care if it's video games, Barbie dolls, G.I. Joe, I don't know. <laughs> blog about something. Be productive and put yourself on a schedule. Every day I'm going to do blah, blah, blah. Every day I'm going to write for two hours. Or at least I'm going to summarize what I'm going to write the next day for two hours. Put some structure into your life. You'll feel better about yourself once you've produced, honestly. Next article. First of all, thank you for all the work you do to get the word out about missing people. I'm sure for many of them, the case is so cold, there probably isn't much help for finding them, so thank you for keeping their names in the forefront of people's minds. I'm sure their families are truly grateful. I was watching your latest video and I wanted to share with you some experiences I had living in Sun Peaks. Sun Peaks was the resort that I talked about in the last video about Ryan Struka. When I heard it, <laughs> Sun Peaks that popped into my mind when I heard about the young man called Ryan who went missing. Please bear with me. Back in 2012, my husband, then fiance, and I moved from New Zealand to Sun Peaks to do a season on the ski slopes. Let me just say by starting that this town is magical, small, charming, and there's a great sense of community. I can imagine when Ryan went missing, everyone was doing their best to find him. I worked for the Sun Peaks Resort in ticketing, and part of my job was having to stand at the bottom of the ski slope and scan everyone's ski passes when they took the lifts up the mountain. You know, I, I was six, year, six years old when I learned to ski in California. My folks had a house. Yeah, up near ski slopes and I've been skiing my whole life. I remember, I always remember seeing these people standing in line punching tickets and I'm thinking, wow, these people must be freezing their butt off standing there in the cold. One morning I was opening at Burfield, which meant I had to be up around 6.30 and down at the ski lift to open before the patrons arrived. Where I lived was about a halfway between the main resort and the Burfield ski area. The main road I walked down to get to work was quite long. It had a golf course on one side and a very large steep embankment that led up to the tree line on the other. Every time I had to walk down that road at night or before sunrise, there was a deep sensation of being watched from the tree line atop the embankment. I thought it was just me, but one day when I was speaking to my brother-in-law, who also lived with us, who also lived with us, I told him about it. He told me he also had that same feeling. We didn't have a car. You didn't need one because the village is so small, and you had to be up around 4 a.m. every morning to do the weather report for the ski resort. So this was a consistent theme. Something was watching from that tree line. Now, I'm not saying it's supernatural. There were cougars around, but they were very, very rarely seen afoot anywhere near town. In the time I was living there, I think there was only one set of tracks found, and it was miles down a Nordic ski trail. The other strange thing that happened to me while I was living there was as follows. I'd gone alone to a party down on Burfield Drive when we had only moved there just recently. I was trying to break the ice with a group of people I had met and thought it would be a good way to do it. I had a great time at the party, but at around 12 to 1 a.m. I was pretty drunk and decided it was time to go home. I took the path home that led through the outskirts of the golf course in an attempt to not have to walk down the creepy road I spoke about earlier. About halfway back when I was crossing the bridge over the little creek, I was immediately hit with that feeling of being watched. I felt absolutely terrified. I froze and looked around. There was nothing to be seen, but I couldn't shake that sense of dread that got worse and worse with every step I took. Eventually I started running because I felt I was, like I was going to be attacked by something. I can't explain it. When I think back on this now, it's quite unusual because when I'm intoxicated, I tend to go to the other way. Don't feel fear. I do stupid things, and when I look back on, I'm thankful nothing bad happened. Luckily, I made it safe that night home. Luckily, I made it home safe that night, bar a couple of bruises from falling over on the icy path. I can't help but wonder if something similar happened to Ryan, but unfortunately, he didn't make it out. 
It seems very odd to me that he never was found. Some Peaks is small. It's not like the big resorts. So if he was there, he 100% would have been located when the snow thawed. One thing I'll mention is, due to its remote location with not much around other than the resort itself, it's not the place that you would have random people driving through at 2 a.m. when Ryan, Ryan went missing. In winter, all the roads are pretty much pure snow and ice, so if he was hit by a car, his blood would have been seen on the ground, and if it had been dug out by whoever got him, that would have been noticeable too. Again, thanks for all your work. Well, thank you for that perception about Sun Peaks Resort and Ryan Stuka's disappearance. That really does bother me. It's something that's bothered me for a long time. Now, somebody sent me something about Marco Polo. And uh, it's fascinating. And Marco Polo wrote a journal. And uh, he was born in 1254 in Venice, Italy. And he lived until January of 1324. He traveled through Europe and Asia, but he stayed in China for 17 years. Here's what was in the journal that was given to me. It's talking about a large body of water. It consists altogether of mountains and valleys of sand, and nothing is got to eat. But after traveling a day and a night, you find sweet water sufficient for from 50 to 100 men with their animals. A larger body could not be supplied. This water is seen daily or altogether in about 28 places, and except for three or four, it is good. Beasts or birds, there are none because they could not find food. But there is a greater wonder which I must now tell you. When a party rides by night through this desert and anyone lags behind or straggles from their companions through sleep or any other cause, when he seeks to return to them, he hears spirits speak to him in such a way and manner that they seem to be his comrades and they frequently call him by name and thus lead him out of his way so that he never regains it. And, he, and many persons are thus lost and perish. What? Remember, if you follow my work, you know, I've told you many times that the last person in line in a group of people is the one who disappears. And this person was paying attention and found this in Marco Polo's journal. This is amazing. Read that to you again. When a party rides by night through this desert and anyone lags behind or straggles from his companions through sleep or any other cause, when he seeks to return to them, he hears spirits speak to him in such a manner that they seem to be his comrades and they frequently call him by name and thus lead, and thus lead him out of his way so that he never regains it, and he, many persons are thus lost and perish. It goes on, I must tell you too that even by day you hear these voices of spirits, and even tambours and many other instruments sounding. They find it necessary also, before going to rest at night, to fix an advance signal pointing out the course to be held afterwards. Likewise, attach a bell to each of the animals that they may be more easily kept from straggling. In this manner, amid much danger and fear, this desert is passed. Now we must tell you of the countries that lie on the other side. So I was only sent this small two paragraph piece that directly addressed, oh my gosh, lagging last in line. That was great. And uh, I wanna make sure I, I get this right. That was from Lauren. Lauren, great job. Thanks for sending that in. Now, people say, well, what do you read these stupid letters for? For that exact reason. Because I probably have a hundred pieces of supporting evidence to what's happening and what, what we talk, talk about from people like you that have found literature. It's amazing. So, thank you. Now, the three cases I'm going to talk to you about today are... Amazing to say the least. I've known about them for a long time. But before I get those, why don't you grab a cup of coffee, 
some nice pastry, a bear claw, I'm an ex-cop so cinnamon roll. <laughs> Put your feet up and you're going to listen to three amazing stories that will baffle your ideas about missing people. So the first case involves a, a man that went missing on the Pacific Coast Trail. Now some of you may not know about that, but it goes from Mexico to Canada, up through California, Oregon, and Washington. And uh, it's an amazing, it's amazing piece of uh, dirt. But uh, this man's name is Chris Fowler. He's 34 years old. He's missing October 12, 2016 at White Pass in Washington. He was born in Norfolk, Virginia. His dad was in the Navy. And when he was young, they moved to an area in Dayton, Ohio. Now, when Chris was real young, his mom died. And at that time, his dad shortly thereafter married a new woman named Sally. And Sally was really Chris's mom through his entire life. Well, he went, ended up going to college and he ended up getting a Markham marketing communication degree. And he worked for a, a logging or a logistics company in the trucking business. Liked his job. Well, in two, 2016, they announced they were going to relocate to a different area in the U.S. He didn't want to go. He liked Ohio. And he took a leave. Well, he quit. And he told his mom and dad that he wanted to, he told his mom that he wanted to go on a big hike of five months along the Pacific Coast Trail. And he started to map it out. And he was a really educated outdoorsman in super good shape. And everyone around Chris said, whatever he did, he did it well, and he did it right. And he was smart. Keep that in mind. So what he did is uh, he planned out his trip at intervals where he could get supplies, talk to his mom, and have things sent to him. So he planned this all out. And in May 2016, he started his journey down near Mexico and California. He started hiking north. Well, on August 10th, 2016, first of all, let me catch you up here. It's Chris. It's one of the pictures that were taken while he was on the trail. Okay. So, on August, October 10th, 2016, he was in Washington and he needed some supplies. So he got a ride from someone to go to Packwood, Washington. Got supplied up. On October 12th, he got another ride back to a place called White Pass on the Pacific Coast Trail, the trail heads there. And he walked into a place called the Cracker, with a K, barrel, store on White Pass. So picture, what it is, it's a gas station with a store. The summit of White Pass, that is that little green sign right there. And he went in the store, he's seen on CCTV, gets a cup of coffee, talks to some people, tells them what he's gonna do. And they said, hey, you know, a big storm is coming. It's gonna be here in a day or two. And he goes, yeah, I heard. And they said, are you ready? Yeah, I got it. I'm ready for it, don't worry. And they said, I wouldn't go out there. And he said, no, no, I'll be okay. So he takes off. That's a, and he's seen leaving that store last time he's ever seen. And a lot of people think that was suspicious. Now, when people hadn't heard from him for weeks, they ended up getting a hold of the sheriff's office and they start checking that trailhead and they start checking the people along the trail and they put up flyers. And the Pacific Coast Trail is a very busy place. You know, there's not like a hiker every 100 yards, but there's a lot of, bit, there's a lot of people on the trail. 
There's a lot of people that do it. Some people start in Canada and go to Mexico or vice versa. But during those five months where the weather's good, it's busy. So the idea that you're not going to be seen on a trail, it's pretty odd. But he's reported missing on October. The last time anyone could see him was October 12th. But it was, it was long after that that someone actually realized he was missing and reported him. And his mom, Sally, contacted the sheriff. And the Yakima County Sheriff's Office started to look for him. Now, that storm I told you about that arrived on the 14th was one of the biggest in 100 years. It dumped two feet of snow in that area that he was in. And it was brutally cold. So the, sh the sheriff decides what they're going to do is they're going to check his phone. And they found that one hour after leaving that store, the Cracker Barrel, he turned his phone off. Which would have been right if he was on the trail. He was described as a super capable outdoorsman. Uh, the sheriffs searched for days. Sally flew out from Ohio, kept looking. They didn't find anything. Now, let me show you this. This is a map of the Pacific Coast Trail. He started down in Mexico, and he worked his way up. Now, Going on, on the outskirts of the Los Angeles Basin, you cut through up into the Sierras. You stay on the eastern side of the Sierras, up through Lake Tahoe area, Desolation Valley Wilderness, up through Mount Shasta area, cut up through Oregon. Then you stay up through the Cascades, enter Washington, stay in the Cascades, right by Rainier, Adams, all the way up, and White Pass is right here. He only had several hundred miles to go until he was done. And he wanted to finish. That's what he told his mom. Now, here's the odd thing to me. Chris was 34 years old. He was a man. He had life experience. He was smart. He knew the outdoors. He knew this big storm was coming. Question is, did he still go out into that wilderness knowing that a huge storm was about to hit? Some people say, no, he didn't. He just wanted to disappear. Other people said, no, he went out there, but nobody, was, nobody saw him on the trail. And now, that happened October 12, 2016. We're in October 2021. And nobody has found one piece of his equipment Nothing he was carrying, his remains, it's hard to believe. Sorry, I just find it hard to believe. What happened to Chris Fowler? I don't know. But uh, he's one of many missing people in Washington State, and they have a lot. And uh, Sally? His mom, I feel very sorry for you. You treated that, that young man like your son for a lifetime. And in 2017, you lost Chris's dad, your husband. That's, that's a big loss, Sally. I feel for you. Okay, the next case. When I first heard about this case, I was living in Colorado. Happened in California, an area I know very well. About 12 miles north of San Francisco is a very idyllic community in Mill Valley. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the song, Mill Valley, California, that's my home. Well, that song describes an idyllic community and that's it's pretty darn nice up there. And they have Mount Tamalpais Mount Tamil Pius State Park, and that's the center of the next two stories. Just west of there uh, and north, well, just west is the Pacific Ocean, and just north is Mount Reyes, or Point Reyes State uh, National Park. 
And that area of the Pacific Coast, of Mount Tamalpais, really suspicious disappearances there. So, first case is about a woman and 33 years old, brilliant. Uh, she was a software designer working for MIT. That's a hard job to get. Now, as someone who recruited software designers when I worked in Silicon Valley, they are hard to get, they're very brilliant, and they're hard to keep because they're in such demand. Anybody who's a mediocre software designer can get a job anytime they want. Now, this woman's name was Magdalena Glinkowski. She was reported missing, or she went missing on March 30th, 2014. She was a resident of Menlo Park. Menlo Park is a community right next to Palo Alto, right next to Stanford University, uh, in a real nice part of the San Francisco Bay Area. Really nice. Now, on March 30th, she rented a car, and a lot of, a lot of these people that live and work their jobs uh, don't get cars. They take public transit, and she didn't have one, and there's a lot of places you could just easily rent a car quick. She did, and she went up to Mount Tamalpais, and she was dressed for hiking. And it was, it was a nice March day, she arrived and she buys a one day pass, parking pass. And she's dressed for a nice hike in the woods on a warm day. So closed circuit TV, after she paid for her parking pass, that is Magdalena walking out onto the trail. Bright pink top, running shorts, and she's off, 33 years old. Now, she lived alone. Nobody realized that she was missing for four days, five days. And here's what happened. They finally found a note that she left, apparently at work, that said where she was going. So they looked and they found her car parked in the parking lot and they start searching. They search for 12 days. Canines, air support, ground pounders, hundreds, couldn't find her. Then on April 12th, the 12th day, after everyone had left, a runner that had been running on the trails 13 days ago, 12 days ago, Remembered seeing her, you know, bright colors, attractive lady. He calls in and says where he was, she was last seen. So they get an idea in the park where to look. Well, they find her. Now, let's, I want you to look at the picture again. Does this lady look like she's going to go into the brush and bushwhack off trail in heavy timber, thick brush. Friends, I don't think so. This is the description where they found her. Very steep terrain, southeast slope, rarely traveled drainage, meaning a drainage is where there's water, off trail, and she's identified by her fingerprints. The coroner said there's no obvious injuries to the body. There was never any release about the toxicology report. There was never any cause of death released. And the case quickly got off the front page of the newspaper. Sorry, friends. I'm not an idiot. I saw that case and I said, mm-mm. Something's wrong. <laughs> I know something's really wrong. And five days after she disappears, something else happens at the same park. Yeah, the same park. 
This park is surrounded by a super high-end community. Nothing ever happens there. It's idyllic. There's no crime. Nobody's ever found they're dead. Unless maybe they fall dead, drop dead on the trail from a heart attack, but nothing ever unusual. Yet five days after Magdalene is found, they have another disappearance. How weird is that? Marie Sanner, S-A-N-N-E-R, 50 years old. April 17th at 2.30 p.m. Marie is one of those idyllic souls we need in the world. She had an educational degree and a secondary education teaching credential for bilingual teachers. And she taught kindergarten in the Oakland School District to underprivileged kids. Yeah, a great soul. She was from that area in Mill Valley, in Marin, around Mount Tamalpais. Yeah, right from there. Yet every day she drove into Oakland to teach those kids and come home. So she came home, she got her German Shepherd dog, and she drove out to Mount Tamalpais State Park. Now, Marie ended up parking her car on the Panoramic Highway. This is Marie. Now, she parked on the highway probably because she didn't want to pay the parking fee because she was an underpaid teacher. But she hiked rigorously and knew this park like you know your backyard. She had lived in that area for 50 years and had taken her dog for a hike there all the time. She knew exactly where to park to avoid paying the parking fees. Smart. Well, she was reported missing later that day by her dad. And a search started almost immediately. The next day, they bring in canines. And all of a sudden, they find her dog wandering around her car right on that panoramic highway. Well, they knew something was really wrong, that she had to be somewhere. And two hours into this massive search, they find her body off trail right next to a creek. The coroner des described blunt head trauma from a fall, but didn't list that as the primary cause of death. There was no fractured skull, Magdalena and Marie were found one mile apart from each other. Both ladies lived alone, had professional degrees, were hiking alone when they disappeared, had no kids, were not married, both Caucasian, and both athletic. No cases of this before in the park or after in the park. Now, this is the park right here. This is where Marie's car was parked on the panoramic highway right near Mountain Home. She's found over here on the other side of the highway up off of the Matt Davis Trail, and this is Fern Creek, and she was found just west of Fern Creek. Now, Magdalena's car is parked over here at the Pantel campground. Very strangely, law enforcement never identified the exact location where she was found, nor what clothing she was carrying or found on, what position she was found, nothing. They did say that Marie and Magdalena's bodies were one mile apart. One thing I have implored upon you over the last year is please don't take 
everything you hear as gospel. Oh, you know, if the news isn't making a big deal about it, it must not be a big deal. Local reports for local consumption. Let's quell all these problems, not a big deal. Um, the deputy said there's no foul play in this. It's just one of those odd occurrences. Two females with that profile I just gave you disappear with just in a, a few days of each other. Don't worry about it. Pull. You know why? Because on the other side of the mountain, on the Pacific coast, there's two other females that disappeared under very similar circumstances in another county's jurisdiction in Point Reyes National Park. That's right. But let's not talk about the comparisons. This is the part that worries me in my world. It's pretty obvious that something's going on. Do you really believe, does anybody out there believe that Magdalena, dressed in those shorts, is going to go off trail and bushwhack through heavy brush, get all scratched up, catch poison oak, to do what? Give me a break. No way. They tried to make it sound like uh, Marie Sanner was walking at dark and, oh, in a very dangerous area and she didn't know where she was going and she fell down an embankment and into the creek bed. Well, first of all, she was with her dog. Dogs can see expertly at night. All she has to do is follow her dog. And she grew up in this area. She grew up hiking in that park for 50 years. Come on. She knew exactly. She probably could wear a mask and find her own way home in that park. But again, the news is going to spin this. Oh, you know, but they never released a cause of death of either woman. That is troubling to me. And it goes back to what I've said before is that there's, there's part of this linkage. Now, two ladies fitting that profile in the same period. I don't believe that law enforcement would lie if there was substantial injuries, meaning a physical, brutal attack and rape on each woman in that park. The reason I don't believe they would is because there's too many deputies and technicians working those scenes. Eventually, you'd get out. But if there's something just odd about it, eh, they won't say anything. I don't know if Magdalena had all of her clothes on when she was found. I don't know if she had her shoes on. I don't know if Marie had her shoes on or had all of her clothes on when she was found. And then what I always am interested in knowing especially in Magdalena's case where she was missing for 12, 13 days before they found her and they, <clears throat> and they had terminated her search and given up on finding her. What was the stomach content she had? Yeah. What does that tell you? When was the last time she ate? What did she eat? How long has it been since she ate? Yeah, those are important. And I'm always interested in that, and I can rarely find that. California has weird laws when it comes to cause of death and coroners. It gives them a lot of latitude to talk about what they want and not release what they don't want. As an example, the Garish family outside of Yosemite, the three people that dropped dead essentially in the same spot on a trail, a mile and a half from their car, coroners, they didn't release much about that. Like, I'd want to know what was in their stomachs. Did they die and there was a lot of liquid in their stomach? Well, that wouldn't make sense if it was hyperthermia, would it? Some people said it was over 100 degrees for them. Others said it was around 90 degrees. Some people said they did have water. Some people said they didn't have water. But as I've stated before, 
The case makes no sense to me. Just like the disappearances of Sanner and Glinkowski make no sense to me. But that, those stories of those two ladies rarely talked about, but are strange. So, if you like this segment, please give me a couple of thumbs up. Last thing I'm going to say, we're approaching November. This is always the time where we start running low on products. I rarely say anything to you guys because people hammer me, oh, it's just there to sell books. I'm just telling you this because you guys are friends. I know a lot of people like to order Christmas gifts right before the holidays, you know, like between Thanksgiving and Christmas. If you're thinking about ordering missing 411 books, now might be the time to do it. It takes us about a month and a half from the time we order books to get them. So we're probably not going to be ordering any more books the rest of the year. Uh, we have a pretty good supply right now of Bigfoot books and of missing 411 books. So if you're interested, I would order them now to ensure you're going to get them for the holidays. USPS has been notoriously slow right now, even with priority books that we mail. Uh, priority mail is still, they say it's two to three days. Really, it's like seven to eight to ten days sometimes to get to the East Coast. And they won't even, they won't even apologize for it. They just say, yeah, well, that's what the times are for us. So whatever. But uh, yeah, if you're thinking about getting books, I would order them now just to make sure you do get them. So uh, you guys really appreciate all the support you've given. You can follow me at uh, Twitter, David Politis at Can I Am Missing. Our website for missing people, canammissing.com, like Canadian American, canammissing.com. And our YouTube site that you're on, Can Am Missing. Can and a missing project. And uh, thank you very much for all your support. You guys be safe. The best Christmas gift you can ever give to anybody who likes the outdoors is, that's right, personal locator beacon. <laughs> so thanks again. Have a good week.